Welcome to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast, hosted by the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association. We provide you with up-to-date information on health topics geared towards the Orthodox Jewish community. This podcast content is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as medical advice or as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician. Welcome to the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association, or JOMA, podcast. I'm your host, Elisa Minkin. I'm a general pediatrician and proud JOMA member. And today, I'm really, really honored and really, really excited to be interviewing Danielle Ofri. Again, if there are topics you want to hear, you want to speak, you know someone who you want to hear, you have comments on this podcast, please reach out to us at health, H-E-A-L-T-H, at JOMA.org. So Dr. Danielle Ofri, MD, PhD, is one of the foremost voices in the medical world today. She is a primary care internist at Bellevue Hospital and clinical professor of medicine at NYU, as well as founder editor-in-chief of the Bellevue Literary Review, and her rating appears in the New Yorker, the New York Times, as well as the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine. She's given several TED Talks and performed at the Moth. Ofri is the author of six books about life in medicine. Her latest is When We Do Harm, A Doctor Confronts Medical error. She can be reached at www.danielle, D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E, O-F-R-I, O-F-R-I.com, www.danielleofri.com. So I, I was really, really excited about this opportunity to do this interview. I am a um, huge reader, and I especially love books by doctors, um, for doctors, although these books are also for patients, which I find to be an incredible combination. Um, she's really, really honest and open about her own feelings and experiences, and I think that gives a unique window into How Doctors Think, which is the title, oh, not one of her books. There is a book called How Doctors Think by Jerome Groupman, and um, I feel like she takes that aspect of um, the doctor's perspective and takes it into the feeling realm, and that's the name of her book, What Doctors Feel, how Emotions Affect the Practice of Medicine from 2013. Um, and she also wrote What Patients Say, What Doctors Hear, 2017. And her latest book, as I mentioned earlier, is When We Do Harm, A Doctor Confronts Medical Error. We really have to rebuild the trust that has eroded so much during the pandemic, although it was eroding before too. And I think that all three of these books that I mentioned are linked by the centrality of the human relationship between the doctor and patient. Trust has to be earned and relationships take work. Welcome, Dr. Ofri. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Oh, I, as I told you before, I am the hugest fan of your writing. I am beyond excited to be doing this. And as I told you, I find it therapeutic as a physician. I think a lot of people feel like physicians are not necessarily um, understanding about how patients feel or, or empathic about it, but we, we can be, and you show how that can be, but these communication, um, between patient and doctor can go awry, right? It can go wrong. Every day, every day. Yes. So I'd love to start with some of your stories. Cause that's how you write, you write stories, which I, I can't stop reading <laughs> more than once. <laughs> Um, so I, I can share the story of, of a patient of mine, uh, Mr. Omar Amadou, which is not, not his real name, but I, I do clinic on Thursday evenings. So Thursday is a very long day. And so it was sort of the end of the day, um, getting ready to leave, computer off, bag packed, ready to click off the light when the phone rings. And you always like debate, should you answer the phone as you're about to leave? But I pick it up anyway, and it's Omar Amadou. And, you know, he's a guy who... I, at that point, I've known him maybe about two years, but I've probably fielded a hundred calls from him. He always needs something, a form, you know, a, a, a medication, a renewal of this, of that. And he always needs it right away. And there's always this urgency. And I, despite his West African accent, I can hear this sort of whininess that just makes me crazy. On the other hand, he's a really sick guy. He's got a really bad uh, heart condition. He's only 43. And on his first day, he lugged in this tome of medical records you know, of all his stays in the ICU. So I, I have to take him seriously. And he says, Dr. Ofri, I need to see you. It's really important. I ask him questions. I can't find anything specific. I say, listen, 
tomorrow's Friday. I'm not here on Fridays, but please come into our urgent care clinic because I want to make sure this gets seen. Um, anyway, I come in Monday. There's an indignant voicemail message from Mr. Amadou saying, I come Friday, you know there, so I go home. So back and forth, we exchange messages the whole week. You know, if you're feeling sick, come to walk in. If not, make an appointment. He writes back, I need to see you. It's really important. A week goes by and it's the following Thursday and I'm getting ready to finish up my morning clinic. And all of a sudden I spy Mr. Amadou in the waiting room and he's waving, waving. He's tall and it's like a stringy bean pole. He's wearing his powder blue track suit. He says, Dr. Ofri, I need to see you. It's really important. And I'm really in a bind, you know? I've got a packed waiting room, I'm full of patients. And I think, well, do I need to make boundaries here? I can't just like, he can't just come demanding an appointment. He'll be here every day. On the other hand, he's really sick. On the third hand, it's work now or work later. I'm thinking I have to see him now. I'll see him later. I'm like, all right, just this once, you know, come on in. Um, but next time you have to make an appointment like everyone else. And so I bring him and he's got this broad smile and I figure he's got the system licked, right? Just be persistent and he'll get in. And he comes into my office and um, he's in the doorway and it's like his, he's about to, he's kind of freezes in the doorway. His foot is raised kind of halfway in, halfway out, but it's all an illusion as he drops to the floor with his heart stopping thud. I, suddenly like you're, you know, in this like new mode and, and, and um, I, I call for oxygen and a stretcher. I try to you know, listen to his heart, his pulse is racing. I can't get a pulse ox reading. His hands are frigid. He's grasping his chest saying, my heart. And of course, I'm feeling horrifically guilty. His legs are out in the hallway. His head's in my doorway. We, we, we haul him onto a stretcher, race down to the ER. And um, I, I hand off care to my ER colleagues. And I, and I take his hand as before I leave, which is, of course, is so cold. And I apologize for berating him in the waiting room. And as I walk back to clinic, you know, um, just sort of disconsolate. I'm kind of staring at the linoleum and all those little dots on the floor, thinking, what, what was, why did we not hear each other? And it felt like we were trying to talk the same language, but we were not hearing each other. And, you know, late, later on, as I, um, when he finally was discharged, you know, after his pacemaker was replaced and he had the fluid drained out of his lungs, I kind of realized that we were just speaking kind of divergent dialogues, you know, um, and I sort of perceived him as a difficult patient, irritating, insistent, and I got resentful. Um, but if I'd stop for a moment, I think, to think about what it was like to be Mr. Amadou, right? Here he is, you know, navigating an unforgiving medical system, negotiating in a foreign language, dealing with a heart that's warranty was given out way before it should have been. You know, I could understand his approach, why wouldn't he refuse to take no for an answer? Why wouldn't he be insistent? But I didn't get that until he collapsed in my doorway. And, you know, when he came back in his trusty tracksuit, I was just so relieved to see him. And of, and of course he was, you know, his first question is, when's our next appointment gonna be? And, you know, normally that would irritate me, but I, I felt like I could commit not to like making things perfect, but that I could think more carefully about how I listen to what my patients are saying and more carefully about what I say to them, because we aren't always talking the same language. And, you know, if, if I could take the moment to think about what he's experiencing, what he's trying to say, maybe I wouldn't have been so annoyed and I wouldn't maybe have missed the boat on what turned out to be a very life-threatening uh, presentation. That is an amazing story. You know, you mentioned difficult patients. Can we talk more about different kinds of difficult patients, at least how we perceive them to be difficult? Right. You know, it's funny because we use that term and I put in quotes. Right. I mean, Air quotes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a term in medicine, the difficult patient. But what is a difficult patient? Someone who is making our, our day a little bit harder. And that may be not a fair statement, but anyone who kind of gums up the workings of the hospital or right, of the medical practice. Now, partly, you know, patients don't see the medical side, right? We've got hundreds of patients. We've got many to see the whole ward, a whole day full of patients. So if someone takes longer or brings up things we can't solve, you know, that makes this very complicated process just go awry. It's not the patient's fault. They're not responsible for a crazy system that's set up to fail. But nonetheless, the doctor or the nurse gets caught in this. And so the resentment sort of comes after the patient, the difficult patient. So it's any time I think, you know, the wheels stop moving smoothly, we say, oh, difficult patient. 
Now, what, what does that mean? Now, there are some people, some patients who are rude and obnoxious and sexist, racist, and just like anyone else in society. And, and those you could say truly are difficult, just people, and they happen to be patients. We've got just as many on the you know provider side as well. But putting that sort of category aside, I think there are patients um, who come in a couple of things. And one of them, I think a big one is patients who have problems that we can't solve. It's not their fault, but we, I think, feel profoundly inadequate. Um, so many of my patients come in, let's say, with chronic pain. Now, may, someone may have chronic pain because they injured a leg and, well, okay, we can do physical therapy, but people have chronic pain because they've got bad shoes. They've got chronic pain because they can't sleep because they're holding th down three jobs. They have chronic pain because they're suffering because a spouse has abandoned them or their child's in jail and they're caring for a grandchild. They're in pain because they don't have documents and they you know, are being abused. And, and there's so many reasons that patients are in pain that we cannot solve. And these are problems that are real, but they're simply out of our ability. And, and for lots of our patients, you know, if we could get them you know, better housing or a more stable spouse or, or a stable job or a better education, um, you know, or, or, or services that they, they could really use, a lot of their pain, anxiety, depression, all the things together would probably be relieved. If my patients didn't get up at five o'clock in the morning to, to clean three houses, you know, their feet wouldn't hurt as much. I, I know that, but I can't solve that. And so we're stuck with, oh, trying to solve their pain. And our tools are so limited because they're just band-aids at best. And we know that and we feel inadequate. But of course, we don't really think about that. And we sort of take oh, the difficult patient. They're always little whining and complaining, you know, about aches and pains of daily life, but there are real, real things. Um, and, and, and so that's a one category. I'll just give you one more. And there's the patient who seems demanding of information. They always have a sheet of 50 questions. You know, they want to know every side effect of every medication. They want, um, they want to know why this, why that. And of course, all those questions are legitimate, but you know, there's 600 things to do in that 15 minutes. And if every one of those 600 things, the patient wants to know 50 details about it, it's just overwhelming. Every one of those requests in and of itself is valid, but for the provider, for the nurse, the doctor, it just feels like you're being, you know, it's a barrage, you know, of, of information and we just can't manage. And so we, we then think of the difficult patient. Those are great explanations. I want to go back a little bit over all the issues that we're facing that the patient may not be aware of. I love when you write about that. I feel very validated. All right. You know, um, Anatoly Broyard, when he, the writer, when he suffered from prostate cancer, he, he wrote, um, you know, for my doctor, I'm just one patient on his rounds, but for me, it's the crisis of my life. Right. And that's really valid and important to think about. You're right. You know, in some sense, you know, the patient comes to the doctors in the hospital. This is the peak moment in many senses of their illness, their fears, their worries. And for us, it is our job, you know, and many of us are committed to it and feel like it's more than just a job, but it is our day. It is our daily work. Um, and, and we do have many patients. And so um, I think patients don't recognize, and, and I think maybe some do, that doctors and nurses and most clinicians are in an impossible situation. I mean, it's estimate, I'm a primary care doctor. If we were to do all the required things for a primary care visit, it would take seven hours, right? Just to do all the things that are recommended by every society recommendation group, not to mention that it would generate like three more hours of documentation work. So already being forced to do an impossible task for which there's no way around it other than to cut corners. And, and that, you know, that is morally corrosive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most people go into medicine, go into it for the right reasons. I think people who went to medicine for fame and fortune, they are long gone. They went to Wall Street. <laughs> Far easier ways to make, you know, a good salary than, you know, getting puked on on your shoes and staying up all night. I mean, it's really easier way. So I think the people who go into healthcare are in it largely for the right reasons, but they are in an impossible situation. And if you look at the nurse on the ward, you know, the nurse has more patients than he or she can safely deal with. And that is just true. So the only way to, but there's there's no like magical extra nurses showing up. And so you have to be rushed. You have to not, you know, answer this patient's call because you've got to get those medications. So when patients perceive doctors and nurses as rushed, what they often don't recognize is they're being rushed because they have an impossible job to do. You know, when the patient is um, delayed in the waiting room for an outpatient visit, 
like, oh, you doctors always make me wait. What they may not recognize is that they're delayed because the patient before needed more time. They were sobbing, you know, over their dying child or their cancer diagnosis, or they had a really complicated medical condition. And of course, you know, to kick them out would be inappropriate. Say, oh, I've got to go, next patient. So we give the patients the extra time. That then makes us late. But the other patients don't know that. And, and you know, so there's lots they don't recognize. Yes, there are some doctors and nurses who are, you know, aloof and, and, and overbearing and egotistical, but most of the things that come across, I think that, that patients are frustrated with are reflections of a system that is essentially impossible. And there's no way to make it work in our current iteration. Right. You haven't even mentioned the electronic health care, <laughs> electronic medical records. Yes, of course. So we, we the, the amount of documentation requirements has ballooned and, and you, you can't progress through the visit or the day without doing these all. You can't send a medication that a patient needs until you do these 17 fields. You can't close. So, so doctors and nurses are stuck. You have no choice. And now, you know, part of the, this sort of ballooning of this administrative sort of state of, of medicine is a sudden recognition. And I would say it's on a business level mm -hmm. that, you know, there is ever more stuff to do. And of course, for some levels of employees, they're not going to do it because it's beyond their hours and beyond their pay grade. And they simply won't do it. But with clinical people, doctors and nurses who have sort of taken an oath to their patients, they're not going to walk away at five o'clock if the last patient hasn't been seen or if the potassium hasn't been checked. That's just, it is against our DNA. And so the system has figured out that you have this elastic resource, the professionalism of nurses and doctors and clinical people who are not going to go home until everything is done. And so you can keep squeezing in more and the doctor is still not going to go home until all the patients are seen and they're not going to go to sleep until all the notes are written. And at some point it becomes this exploitation of the professionalism of, of doctors and nurses. You know, a lawyer isn't going to do that. They're going to bill you by, by the minute. The 15 minute, yeah. I mean, one minute, the 30 second interval. Right. Bummer isn't going to do that. But your nurse is not going to leave if the coverage hasn't shown up yet. Your doctor is not going to sign out of the electronic medical record until all the medications are reconciled and the tests have been, have been ordered. You just can't, it's just wrong. And it would be malpractice. And we just, we couldn't sleep that night. We just, that's just the way, you know, I think we're, we're born and bred. And so I, I, I hesitate to say this was a premeditated exploitation of the system, although some people do think it is. I suspect it's more of a creep and a recognition that, you know, the system will still keep going. And I think COVID was, a, was an example of how the system kept going. We were not prepared at all, but the fact that we survived that was because the nurses and doctors didn't go home and didn't say, oh, I'm not going in or, or, I, or five o'clock, I'm, I'm leaving. No, not at all. And there was a brief window, I think, when the public recognized and saw what professionalism means, you know, despite this life-threatening unknown virus and, you know, double shifts and triple shifts, you know, everyone did their job remarkably well. Eagles were put aside, you know, to, to see, you know, chief orthopedic surgeons coming in to be junior medical interns and do what it takes without, you know, throwing a fit was an amazing thing of, of cooperation. Um, and I think that really highlighted what the professionalism is, but I think our current system, which of course is driven by money, um, takes advantage of that in a way that I think the word burnout really doesn't uh, take into account. And people use now use the term moral injury right. in that you're being forced to cut corners and rush over things you know you shouldn't be doing. Um, and if someone was cynical and didn't care, it all wouldn't matter. But if you do care, then it's morally corrosive. And, and you know, it's just it's just a different just a different beast. That is that is such a fantastic explanation. I want to go back to the time the patient needs, right? Because I think that's the devil's in the details there, right? I mean, it's one thing when a patient is crying, you can't just you know push them out the door. But the patient who has those fifty pages, do they need all that time? Right. So and you have to prioritize and you know make boundaries. And it's hard to tell the patient, listen, we can't do all fifty today. And I try to be honest, you know, because if we do that, we'll guarantee being superficial. And I don't want to be superficial with your concerns. So today we're going to pick three or four. You know, you pick two and I pick two. And um, um, but it's hard because there are patients. I had two patients uh, on Monday, both of whom, whom have about 18 active issues, all of which are active. And I can't say, oh, we're only going to do the stroke and the emphysema today and leave out the diabetes. You know, I can't. There are patients who genuinely have 
very complex illnesses. And the truth is ever more so today. You know, now that we have shorter inpatient hospital stays, patients now come to outpatient much sicker. We also have done remarkable you know, um, clinical interventions with cardiovascular disease. So people don't die of their heart attacks at 50. And now at 80, they are living well, but they do have 18 medical problems, all of which are real and active and must be dealt with. And you just can't do that in 15 minutes, especially if they also have psychosocial stress, which nearly everyone does, or they don't speak English, or they have a, you know, a literacy um, barrier, or they're, you know, concerned about, you know, a sick family member that, you know, clouds everything in their life right now. There's so many, or they're struggling financially. Those things come into play and you can't ignore them. They are all real. Right. And I want to flip it back to the patient's perspective, right? Because what, what is a patient to do in this scenario? I mean, if you're too empathic about the physician's problem, you're not going to get taken care of properly. Right. So I think the patients have to, you know, think about the visit. So my advice is, and people always say, well, write it all down, but of course you get the 50 questions thing and that's not realistic. So I talk to patients about prioritizing what's important. Recognize you can't do 50 things in the visit because it just won't be good for either of you. But try to pick the few that are really important. And then at the outset, say, these are the three things I want to make sure we get to. Okay. And, and then how do we set up another time to deal with the other things? Recognize that time. But if the doctor does not get to those three things you mentioned, midway say, hey, there was that other thing I wanted to be sure to get to. So I think you should be able to stand up for that. And if your doctor or nurse doesn't respond well to that, then you need someone different. But I think anyone you know, with, with an ounce of, of, of sensibility, we'll say, oh, you're right, you're right. That was the important thing. I got caught in this, you know, shoulder pain thing. Let's get back to, you know, the stomach issue. Um, to, um, and then to find out, you know, how do I reach you? Um, but also to be cognizant that sending 50 follow-up email messages, you know, is not really fair. No one's compensating doctors or giving them time to, to read those messages. So to recognize that you can only do this much and that there's also a sense of a medical team. I mean, some things, you know, are maybe will be better handled by the physical therapist or the social worker. It doesn't all have to be in your primary care doctor. We tend to sort of put it all on them to solve these problems that really maybe belong elsewhere. Right. I re I'm a big believer in teamwork. I'm a big believer for the patient's perspective to build a team and from the physician's perspective to help them build that team. Yes. You certainly can't do everything. That's absolutely true. And it's also true, by the way, when you talk about emails, about phone calls. Yeah. I don't think people realize when are we supposed to return these phone calls? Right, right. You know, there's there's no allotted time. So, you know, most most clinicians these days end up doing the work at home and on the weekends. And, you know, we, again, by the sense of professionalism, yes, always some work will spill over. You know, patients get sick at in, inopportune times and that, that, you know, that we deal with. But a lot of what is routine stuff is spilled over. And that's the sort of this business model of, of expanding that elasticity of professionalism. Oh, well, of course the doctor will take care of them on the weekend because that's their job. But you know what? If it's just routine work, then we haven't allotted enough time. And of course, time is just money that's paying more for, you know, extra nurses, doctors. Uh, you know, um, just recently in New York, nurses went on strike at two hospitals and they weren't striking for more money. They'd already gotten their pay increase. They were striking for better staffing for more nurses on the ward. And that was a really important thing to point out because they can't do their job well if they can't do it safely. And I really appreciated they were willing to, you know, stop the works because you cannot take care of patients with too few nurses. And there's, there's strong data to support that for every nurse you're short, I think the mortality rate in the ward goes up by 7%. I mean, patients die when there aren't enough nurses and, and we know that. And yet we're, you know, the system is trying to, because nurses cost money and, you know, and you want to save money. And, and, you know, I understand that money's finite, but I get a little bit impatient or sick to my stomach when you see the CEO salaries that are in the right. $50 million dollar things, or you see these beautiful new medical campuses being built that look like, you know, tech campuses with, you know, waterfalls and gleaming glass towers, which is lovely. We should all have that. But you'd get a lot of nurses instead of that, like fancy atrium that they're building with the fancy artwork. Because we're all providers. We are all, you know, pawns in the medical uh, corporate right, machine. Right. And it's funny because, you know, um, medical institutions care a lot about patient um, satisfaction now, but mainly because there's money behind it. I think in the past they didn't really care, but now they do because reimbursements are affected by that. But often that is taken to mean, oh, <clears throat> valet parking and the nice coffee machine and graham crackers in the waiting room. But 
you ask a patient, would you rather have the fancy coffee or extra nurses on the ward? Would you rather have valet parking or more time with your doctor? Well, it's a no brainer. And, um, you know, patients overall, I think what affects their satisfaction is adequate time with people take care of them and feeling like all their needs are addressed, their questions answered, their ability to, to get in contact in a timely manner, that's patient satisfaction. I don't think they care if the paint is peeling. I mean, they do, but they would rather have, right. you know, <clears throat> adequate time with their clinicians. Right. We're not given that choice though. So we still have to go back to what can a patient do? What can a doctor do in this broken system? Right. So, so one is also to be advocates for what, which I think what the nurses did, they were advocates for mm -hmm. that. They said, uh-uh, that is not okay. You cannot get by with the fancy atrium and not have enough nurses. You know, that, that is a no brainer. And, um, you know, and I think that, that we as physicians, you know, we have a collective voice and that we should be, you know, speaking up and again, to frame it in terms of patient safety and patient satisfaction. If you frame in terms of Dr. Burnett, well, they don't, no one really cares about that, to be, to be honest. Um, I mean, the higher ups, I don't think really care, but they do care about, you know, medical error. And so pointing out that, um, so for example, if I see something amiss in our electronic medical record, I now file a patient safety complaint. Like that, that puts a patient safety at risk. This stupidity in this system, um, it's time consuming, laborious, but that is a way I think that we clinicians, instead of just like rolling our eyes and okay, one more Advil, file a patient safety complaint. Every one of those complaints must be followed up on. And the same for patients. If you are being made to wait in the doctor's office, it's not because your doctor is being lazy. It's because they didn't provide enough resources to make this workable file a complaint. And the complaint is about the system, not about your doctor. You know, if you called the nurse on the ward and it took too long for her to answer, don't complain about that nurse, complain about the system that didn't give the nurse enough support to be able to answer your call in time. So that's on the global system. In, in the immediacy, you know, I think we both need to recognize, you know, the system and its limitations. And yet we advocate on a personal, you know, moment. So the patient has to advocate for, these are the things I need to, to get to. I know perhaps we can't get to them all. And the same with the doctor, you know, I want to get to them. You know, I can, I can spend, you know, five or 10 minutes over. I can't spend an hour over because then I'm really hurting other patients. So we have to recognize that and, you know, either do another visit or, or do this with our, our adjunct, something like that. But, but recognize that the system plays a big role as opposed to the individuals. Right. So back to the, um, back to the visit, there are other factors besides the broken system, right? I'm thinking of, for example, a, a patient who is obese, overweight. Um, that is something that is a whole other category. There's a bunch of things to talk about here. There's lots. And I, and I think we could talk about how, how doctors in particular view patients in stigmatized categories. I'll just you know, put it that way. Mm -hmm. so for example, we um, doctors verbally dominate the visit all the time. We talk more than our patients, but we do it even more so if the patients are obese or elderly or pregnant or African-American, Latino, um, of low socioeconomic status, and you name it, we, you know, right. we are even more so. And that's, that's on us. Like that is recognizing our conscious or unconscious biases that we have. And I think we really do have to interrogate ourselves. And, you know, one of the things is, you know, when I, I look at who's coming, you know, on the list for the day, and sometimes I feel an uh, catch kind of thing. And then I have to say, wait a second, what is that reaction? Mm. You know, when I start to like groan, is that the patient who is the annoying patient or whatever it is that that or has some unsolvable problem, you know, am, what am I reacting to? And you know, where's the bias in there? And, and if there is, am I, am I really being fair? And then I say, well, what if that patient who I'm like groaning about seeing were my father, my grandmother, just stopped. Would I want my doctor to groan at this, you know, prospect of my dear grandmother coming to them and try to remember that that's, you know, that person is someone's loved one, right? Someone is worried about them. And, and you know, I can't in the moment, you know, unpack, centuries and decades of racism and system you know it's 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 a, it's a huge project it's a huge project but i think each of us in that one moment can just try to say you know that person that smelly disheveled annoying obnoxious patient or whatever it is that we're responding to was once somebody's child and someone's baby that was treasured um and is a human being and and that could be me 
it could be my family member and how would I want someone to react to them and just try to fight as much as I can to sort of, you know, wipe the slate clean. And this person, you know, I, I think is um, my mod niece who said, may I never see in a patient anything other than a person in pain. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a, it's a hard task because, you know, we all bring baggage. We bring our biases, our stereotypes. We bring our own hurts and traumas and from ourselves as, as do our patients but to try as best we can to push the curtain side. This is a person who's coming to me for their pain, for whatever their needs are. And it is my job and my obligation and also my privilege and honor to be able to help them. And as much as we can to push it aside, you know, close the door, push away the electronic medical record and all the beeping things and phones for this moment, this is the only person who matters in the world. And how can I best help them despite you know the the flawed system and world that we're in that is so beautiful i was thinking of another direction we're going to come back to the direction that i was thinking of in a minute but i just want to talk a minute about what you said about push aside the the emr all the distractions we didn't talk about the interruption problem uh, you know the story of our life right and 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 you know interruptions and i'll put multitasking in with that you know there's no such thing as multitasking right we can't do two things at once we simply cut we cut back and forth and we just lose you know, accuracy in the process. So we're bombarded with multitasking things, interruptions, knocks, phone calls, all of that. It is really hard. And, and, you know, and again, I, I try to pull up the patient safety lens, you know, it is not safe to practice medicine that way, to be to interrupted, to have your train of thought interrupted. And, and again, that's a case we want to make on a larger level, but it's really hard. Alerts are popping up all the time. Um, and so we've, again, made an impossible system. Um, and, you know, every time I get, um, I'm writing a medication for my 72 year old woman and I get like a lactation alert. I'm like, <laughs> is this really worth interrupting me for? The chances of, that someone's gonna be lactating, right? It is possible, mm -hmm. but boy, is that a rare thing? And, and also it then makes me wanna just sort of ignore these things. But of course, some are really important and some are so remote. But it's all like, oh, we'll just, you know, MD aware. We can say, oh, we warned the doctor. Doctor said, okay. And so if the rare complication happens, right. then push the responsibility onto the clinician. Oh, well, you okay that you, you know, but we've made it impossible. So yes, it's a, it's a really problematic thing. And, um, you know, it, it's very hard to do. And and we have to try our best, but it, we're, we're fighting this fire hose. And again, it's our system that's done that. And part of it's not just medicine. It is our society that is now, as, you know, it's okay to have alerts and things constantly you know, interrupting. And maybe it's fine when you're watching your, your sitcom, but when you're trying to counsel a patient about how to face their new diagnosis of cancer or how to think about a DNR or end of life care, you know, getting bombarded is really inappropriate at best. Right. But even for any patient encounter, I like how you talked about how doctors tend to be interrupted within the first 12 seconds, I think is right. the average. The doctors interrupt patients, right? That's, that's, that's the other side of it. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. That. So yes. So when patients talk, we interrupt right. um, and study. So between like eight, and 12 seconds, we cut the patient off. And, you know, when, when I talk to lay audiences about this, they find that statistic shocking, how rude you doctors are. And I try to explain, they were not trying to be rude, at least most of us. Um, but mostly we want to solve the problem. The patient says, I have this problem over here and we dive right in. What makes it better? What makes it worse? How does it start? What does it stop? You know, we because we want to solve it. We don't want we want to solve that problem, make the patient better. But the patient might have had a second thing to say, like, oh, I think I might have had a stroke last week, but we'll miss that because we're down the shoulder pain pathway, chasing that down. And so, um, from um, a patient safety perspective, you know, when we talk about medical error, and the book I wrote after what patients say, what doctors hear, was about medical error when we do harm which to some degree felt like I was rewriting the communication book all over again, because nearly every medical error, honestly, can come down to a communication error. But I, I sort of think about medical errors in two broad baskets. There's the procedural error, you know, operating on the wrong side of the body, emptying the wrong leg, um, and there's diagnostic error, um, a misdiagnosis, a delayed diagnosis, incorrect diagnosis. Now, procedural error that's pretty minimal to checklists. Okay, here's the pre-op checklist. Here's the central line checklist. And we can really minimize procedural error. But diagnostic error isn't amenable to a checklist because it's how we think and you can't checklist the way you think. So solving diagnostic error has been this just difficult nut to crack and we haven't made much progress. So when I think about how we interrupt patients in eight to 10 seconds, 
you can see diagnostic error right there, right in those first eight seconds, because we have cut the patient off and we have missed the rest of their, um, of their opening gambit of what they have to say. And so I think if we can train ourselves to not do that, to sort of like zip down for even just one minute. And I talked to my medical students and house staff about this. You know, you have to be efficient. We're you know, huge, busy practice. But the counterintuitive strategy of saying nothing for the first minute, give the patient what I call full frontal listening, you know, not at the computer, just eye contact, maybe jotting a few notes and that's it. And most patients will say what they have to say in that first minute and get it out. And then you can jump in with your million questions, but let the patient speak. And I think for a couple of reasons, one is again, to decrease diagnostic error, but second, you are making an investment in trust and everything we do is based on that how the patient trusts you when you come to make difficult decisions with them about serious illness and dialysis and DNR, all these things, you need trust. The second, if you're thinking just selfishly to, run to decrease their chance of being sued, in engaging in that trust, if the patient knows you have listened, that is money in the bank, metaphorically, that you know the patient will then know that you are trying your best and listen, mistakes happen and patients know that this is you know an imperfect world. But if they have the sense that you are doing your level best to be straightforward, to listen and respect them, you know, the less likely to, to, you know, throw a lawsuit at which, you know, maybe didn't, wasn't a, 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 um, you know, a motivated thing, just the things that have happened. Um, And the third thing is it is efficient. And then I find when I do that, I have fewer follow-up phone calls and messages because I've given the patient their sort of chance to make their case. I've given them the respect and it doesn't take that long. I mean, one minute of being listened to straight on, that's a lot. In our, in our society, how often does someone give you their full attention for one minute without looking at their phone, listening to something else, looking over there, looking over there? It's actually quite rare. And it is quite, you know, when I, I interviewed um, uh, um, Miss Jansen for my book, who was a chief listening officer. I um, love that. Oh yeah. my gosh. But, to but not in our country though. Right, right. Not, this is not a US thing, as you can probably <laughs> tell. But sitting with her just over coffee, she listened so intently. It was almost unnerving because it never happens. Fully focused and not just the focus, but the questions she asked were questions that were clear that she was listening. It weren't just like, you know, oh, so yeah, kind of questions, but they were serious content, things that she, I, she heard what I said, processed it, thought about it, posed a question. It is like getting a massage. Like you never feel like you've, you've been this well taken care of. We finished our coffee. I felt like, oh, you know, I've just lost 10 pounds and had a back <laughs> and had a facial. You know, I felt you feel so good when someone listens intently and it's so rare. Right. But that takes more than a minute, right? I mean, that minute is nice. Right. But so many patients need more than that minute. And that, that is true. And so I, and I'm honest about that. So I will give them a full minute, minute and then I'll say, listen, you know, I don't want to miss what you're saying. Would you mind if I take notes while you speak? And then I've pulled in the computer as the tool to serve them, not my distraction to turn away from them. Mm. And when patients know we have to write things down, they, they know that. And we know we only have 15 minutes. And so I will give them that. And then I will acknowledge, you know what? I'm going to write while you speak. So I don't miss this. So I'm um, recognizing why my attention looks like it's moving um, and that it's in service for the patient, but it's, it's, it's realistic. I don't have an hour for that. I mean, there'll be the occasional, you know, serious crisis where that requires that, but there isn't any time. If when you take that hour, then you are delaying every other patient, right? Um, and you know, there's lots of downstream things that happen. We don't have a system that's set up for that, unfortunately. So you're you're robbing Peter to pay Paul whenever you try to do that. So you're 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 just trying to, you know, get water from a stone and keep moving things around. So we try our best. And so in practice, you know, a minute, it sounds like not a lot, but it actually is quite a bit. You know, when someone asks you what's going on and then doesn't do a thing and just listens to you straight on, I think if you experience that, you'd be surprised that it feels like a lot because you almost never get a full minute or two or five, you know, just some a finite but not extended amount of time of really full frontal respectful listening. Right, right. That That's something that most people don't get. And it makes a huge difference. And I, I really do find it to be helpful. But let's move beyond the minute and say, what else could happen in that visit? that might not go the best way for the patient in the end. And I'm thinking back to that patient who's obese. So I really want to keep focusing on that because um, you often have the situation where it's the doctor's goal to deal with something and it's not the patient's goal. 
So that's when we recognize. So, so I think weight is a really, you know, interesting issue way to point this out because there's a lot of, you know, there are the medical consequences of obesity, which are real. There are many healthy patients who are overweight and also healthy. That's also true. Um, but the, the more obese people are, the more medical, you know, issues on average happen, not for every person, but it is, a, it is true. You know, we watch our obesity um, and diabetes going hand in hand. And so it is realistic. And, um, but there's also a culture of shaming patients for what seems like, oh, they're shortfalling, you know, oh, you lazy person with no willpower who can't, you know, stop eating. And, and that's, that ends up contaminating, you know, because weight in our, in our society is, is a complicated thing. Um, it is true that it, it, there's a genetic component. It is true that there's more than that because, you know, the, our genes didn't change in two generations, but, but the distribution of weight in our society has. So there are many things. There is a commercial aspect to this. There's a big agricultural, you know, component to this. It, there's no accident that, that, you know, unhealthy food is cheap and healthy food is expensive. Um, and that companies spend a lot of time figuring out how to make their chips, you know, I won't say addictive, but make you want to eat more. And there's a science to that. And so, you know, you are fighting as an individual, not just our genes that were meant for the ice age to like conserve every calorie possible. You're fighting um, a huge well-funded system that is trying to get you to eat more. They, you know, you, you are fighting this avalanche. And so it is really hard to, to beat that. Um, so, but I think we as, as physicians and nurses and, and nutritionists have to recognize the complicated, you know, stew that comes in there. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and obesity is, is one of many issues that maybe patients and doctors see differently. And I think there's a respectful way to say that, you know, um, that, you know, there are some medical consequences of this, you know, and, and the same, I say the same thing about hypertension, you know, blood pressure. It's not about the number. We, we, we use the number because that's an easy fill in, you know, to write a, a weight or a blood pressure number. It's, it's harder to write a paragraph essay about that. But it's not the number of the blood pressure. The goal is to prevent the heart attack and strokes down the line. That's what we care about. And if we could do it at a blood pressure of 150, that's great, or 120, you know, but I want to prevent you from having a stroke because that is a miserable, horrible thing. And that is a worthwhile thing to avoid. And the same thing about weight. It's not the number. That's a marker, an imperfect one. But preventing diabetes is a really important thing because if you get diabetes, that will have an impact on your life that's a real struggle and can you know, and there's of course downstream things from that. And so try to talk about the, the health issues and not the weight per se. Um, and so, you know, and it's also being our healthiest self at whatever, you know, size or weight or age that we are. And so, you know, I think the same thing can be said about, you know, older age, we tend to say, oh, well, someone's 90, you know, so we can sort of ignore those things, but you want to be the healthiest you can be at 90 with your nutrition and exercise and, and all, all of those things. And the healthiest you can be at, at 300 pounds or 200 pounds or 100 pounds. And so to focus on that, you know, I'm trying to look at your whole self and trying to make you as healthy as you can. Um, um, and, and not to, to, to sort of put it as, oh, you know, you should just be eating better. You know, um, we all know that already. <clears throat> we don't need a doctor to say that. Well, exactly. Exactly. We all know that, right? And I think one of the problems that happens is a patient who's struggling with their weight comes to the doctor for, say, a sore throat and gets a lecture about their weight. Right. Or so, even advice that's well-meaning, but they didn't right. come for that. Right, right. Um, yes, that, that is true. But if they come for a sore throat and their blood pressure is 200, over 100, which is very high, as a doctor, you would be remiss not to say, you know, by the way, your blood pressure is really high and that, you know, so... Um, Although I think that weight has a bigger stigma issue for people than mm -hmm. blood pressure number right. is. But so on one side, you could say that's the same thing. We still, if, you're, if your finger stick, your sugar is over 300 and you're here for a sore throat, we, we can't ignore the elevated right. sugar. So there's that too. But the question is how we do. And I think if we approach it like, well, you know, you are just not, you know, eating healthy enough. Um, that's not helpful. Um, but, you know, like I try to ask all my patients as part of my standard thing, you know, how many fruits and vegetables do you eat? Do you have white rice or brown rice? Like, and I ask everyone. I had a young woman um, get very angry at me. She was South Asian. And she said that I was being racist. I was asking her about white rice. And she said, it's because I'm South Asian. You're asking about white rice. Now, I ask every single patient <clears throat> about white rice because 
white rice, you know, um, turns into sugar when you eat it. So for many people, that's a source of simple carbs that will raise their sugar and raise their blood pressure and, and raise their weight. And so I always ask about white rice, white bread, juice, and soda is on my standard list of questions. She didn't know that. And, and so it was interesting, but it's interesting for me because I hadn't thought about that, that it could be perceived that way. And that was a really interesting lesson for me to recognize the questions that I think are generic could be perceived differently. And so that's important. So I think a lot of doctors may be well-intentioned asking about weight and nutrition and not recognize that for many patients that could feel, you know, that could come across in a way that doesn't feel supportive. And so it, it's, and it's hard to know, you know, it, it, it is hard to know. Um, but to try and stress that we're talking about your overall health and not just this number, because your overall health involves many things. Weight is one of them, you know, but if you, your weight is higher, but you are, you know, running three miles a day, you're probably in really good health. If your weight is in the quote normal range, but you're completely sedentary, that's a concerning thing for your health. So we really want to look at it as, as a composite thing and try to, to dial back the focus on the number, the BMI, the, you know, um, and oh, it's just your willpower. I mean, one other thing we often don't talk about a lot is the cost of food. And it's really, you know, and I, you know, many patients who are on, you know, SSI or, 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 you know, SNAP or other assistance, and they can say, you know, in the beginning of the month, I can buy fruits and vegetables at the end of the month, I can't. And you know what, fruits and vegetables, they go bad, and I have to throw them out. And, you know, uh, rice and potatoes don't go bad, and pasta, and, you know, that's a realistic thing. Of course, you know, today with inflation, it's a reality. And I think it's, it's a little bit, you know, not recognizing the reality to say, well, you should be eating five fruits and vegetables a day. That's a really hard thing to achieve. Right, right. There's a great book, How the Other Half Eats. Have you read that one? I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to put a plug here for my registered dietitian friends here. And this goes back to we as doctors can't do it all. In 15-minute visits, sometimes shorter visits, we cannot give full, yeah. complex nutrition advice. Um, but also that you have to ask permission. Because what I was talking about before is that every time the person with a weight issue comes in, they're going to be told about their weight. Right. They don't need to be told right. necessarily. You can ask permission. Right. But I guess then we could say, do you ask permission to talk about your diabetes? Do we ask permission to talk about each of the things that, that come, come on? And, and, I, and I see where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. But I think about the practical issues. I think we're picking weight because it has a particular stigma. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the, the other thing is, you know, you could say the reverse thing of, of this is just one of the many things, you know, we routinely talk about your diabetes, your blood pressure, and we don't ask permission to talk about your pulse. Um, you know, whether you have the toenail fungus, we don't ask permission about those things. Um, so, so I guess what you're saying is that, are you putting weight in a separate category? Like maybe uh, if someone ex has experienced sexual assault or domestic violence, you might, you know, approach that in a careful way, different than you might approach their emphysema, for example. Uh, yeah, it, it, it may be, or you may say, hey, routinely, I talk to every patient about their nutritional status because that's fundamental. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about, you know, you know, what you eat and how much you move. Right. I'm not talking about it at a well visit. I'm yeah. talking about it every single visit. Right. You know, people who are in larger bodies will often say, I go to the doctor, no matter what my problem is, they say, oh, you need to lose weight. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's not a smart way to do it. Right. And, and, you know, and I say, you need to lower your blood pressure. Yeah. Everyone knows that. So, so you're right. I think, I think it's the way we approach it. Um, and, but when someone comes for a sore throat and I see, oh, they haven't had their updated tetanus shot or their COVID booster, I do talk about that. Like from the doctor's perspective, every visit is a chance to, you know, also get to the other issues because they often get lost. So we in primary care, if someone's coming for a sore throat, well, yes, but did they get their colon cancer screening? Now, maybe you don't want to hear about that, but those are important things. And so, again, and now maybe it's the way we phrase it. Mm -hmm. so, um, I'd like to talk about some of your other medical issues today because they're important too, in addition to your sore throat. Um, and so we could be, and I think saying, oh, you need to lose weight. That's a really stupid way to say it, if I can be so blunt, right? Everyone, but we could talk about your overall health and try to maybe normalize that as, you know, you know talking about your nutrition um, and your vaccines and your cancer screenings are all part of things that we do every every visit you come in, no matter what, because some patients only come in for the sore throat and don't come for a well visit. And that's the chance. Oh, you know, you, you missed your hepatitis B vaccination. I do that. Someone comes for blood pressure check. I'm always giving them their vaccinations at the same time, because I want to make sure they get their well care because in our system, it's very hard to do well care. And so, 
Right. Um, you know, and when they come in for their sore throat, if I've got this great new brochure about healthy Newton eating, or, you know, I'm giving that out too, because, you know, every contact with the healthcare system is our chance to, you know, I'm doing COVID boosters, no matter what someone comes in for, I want to get them their COVID booster. And they may not want to talk about it. That is true. But I would be remiss if I didn't use that. But you're right, we could think carefully how we phrase that and, and frame that. Right. I want to dive a little deeper into that because you brought up vaccines, which is a very hot topic that I try to avoid lately <laughs> because it is so triggering for so many people. So say that's your goal. Your goal is the vaccine or your goal is the way people often don't show up because they feel that that's being pushed on them. Right. Well, you know, if if something is medically validated, I would be wrong not to, I mean, push it on them. So maybe it's a way of, to bring that up and to, to counsel them strongly. And so I don't say you know, I, I, here's the vaccine. And I will say, you know, here's the data that show that the new bivalent COVID booster has decreased the mortality rate by 50 to 80%. That's a real number, you know, and you with your conditions of whether it be obesity, and that is a true high risk thing, hypertension, diabetes are at higher risk. So if you were to get COVID, your chance of being in the ICU diet is higher than someone who doesn't have those conditions. And so for you and, and your health, and I don't want to lose you, you know, the benefits outweigh the risks. And you're right, it's a triggering thing, but to like not bring it up because I don't want to trigger someone, then I'm not doing my duty. Like this right. is a validated thing. And and um, and I'm not just say, oh, you want it or not? No, I want to say, here's the evidence that is in preponderance of evidence shows the benefits outweigh the harms. And I'll recognize the harm. Everything has harms. Crossing Second Avenue has harms too, but you make a decision before you cross and if you need to get there. And so to, to just sort of say, you know, or I'll just sit back and you say yes or no, then I'm not being the advocate for your health. Right. That's customer service. Right. And, and I hear that. Mm -hmm. I'm just pushing on this because I do find that there's a subcategory of patients who are adamantly against, for example, vaccines. Right. So again, there's different ways to do this. What I do is if I see that the patient has not been getting it, I ask, can we talk about this? And sometimes they will say no. And I respect that because if I tell them all these things, but they're not willing to listen, I've just used up minutes of my time. Right. I, I will ask, you know, can you tell me why? Like, what's, what's, what are your concerns? You know, and, and sometimes the concerns are very specific and we can address them. Sometimes they're very, you know, um, amorphous, but I do also have to say, I know you're feeling that, but I, I would, I would be derelict if I didn't point out that, you know, you're declining what is a really valid thing. And in fact, that this vaccine may have more impact on your, and they say, why are you taking blood pressure pills? Like, think about why you take your blood pressure pills and why you won't do that. And um, I do want to interrogate that. Like, why? And, and I use, and I mean, like interrogation, but I do want to, like, push back a little bit. You take your blood pressure pills because we want to prevent an outcome. This is the same kind of thing. And yet, you have this, this, um, you put vaccines in a different category than blood pressure pills, and you shouldn't. Everything is a decision we make for our health, and we weigh the pros and cons, right? wearing a mask, taking blood pressure pills, getting a, you get your mammogram every year. And you know, are the benefits really outweighing the, the harms? You get a PSA test. Is that really beneficial? You know, I have people who get a PSA test, but not get a COVID vaccine. And if you, if you look at the right. actual data, the COVID vaccine is, is a hundred times more beneficial than a PSA test. Um, that number may or may not be exact, but vastly more. And so I want to sort of push into the psychological realm because I think it's also our job in the public health sense to sort of confront the, and people are like, well, I just don't feel good about it. Well, why? Let's, let's right. talk about that. Where are you getting that from? And to let people know that they're getting information kind of through the ether right. that is actually harming them um, and, and, and harming their families. You know, if you don't get the COVID vaccine and you get it and you're fine, but then your grandmother gets it and she could die. Like, you know, and I try to talk about vaccines as community service and not just, oh, you don't want it. Okay, fine. You know, you know, so um, I, I, Sometimes, you know, I regret that I started down that pathway because it can take the whole time and maybe you know, we can't do it today, but I try to periodically in a non-judgmental way as much as I can, but, you know, I don't call the facts judgments. The facts are the facts, you know, and, and to, to, to not say the benefits because you're being judgmental mm -hmm. is wrong, but of course we can do it not in a condescending way. You know, here, here's what the data show. Um, and I want to know why you're, you don't want something that, 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 you know, we think will be beneficial and why you will take something. Why are you taking multivitamins? Let's talk about that. 
you know, why are you taking supplements, you know, over the counter that you're buying? You see these things that say this one treatment will cure cancer. Well, God, if it cured cancer, <laughs> trust me, we'd be on that one. You know, you're willing to do that. Why are you not? Can, can we, you know, talk about that? Ask me your questions. Um, and, and then, you know, if you, and I always say, it's your, I'll never tell you what to do. Right. Right. It's your decision. I'll respect that. But I will, you know, be be vocal in what I think are the benefits and that I think you're giving up on. And, you know, but we can also put this aside, you know, if, if, we're, if we're done with that, you know, we've talked about it. You've given me the respect of giving me your honest answers. I've given the respect of my honest answers. And then, yeah, we'll put it aside because, you know, you don't want to do it this time. That's fine. But at least we've spoken about it. Right. I think it's all in the delivery. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had a situation where somebody exploded about something like this? Because I have. Um, I've had I did exactly that and the, yeah. the, the parent went up to the front room said loud so that everybody in the, in the office could hear I never want Dr. Minkin to see my kids again yeah yeah All right it that will occasionally happen but that's that person right I would say most people would respond by appreciating your concern taking the time to talk about it and if someone's going to explode over that then they're you know having their their own you know P patients run the same gamut as, as anyone. And there are some people who are gonna yell at customer service no, no matter what. And it feels horrible because you're trying to do the right thing, but you know, that will occasionally happen and it feels awful. Yep, I've, I've been fired by you know, a few patients um, you know, for, for various and sundry things and complaints made. Um, and, and, and I think we have to decide, you know, I would, here's the best way that I can sort of ethically and morally practice medicine. And I can't compromise that. I think this is ethical. And if someone disagrees with that, that may be, maybe they need a different position. That's, you know, and I respect that. And I'll refer them to someone if, you know, uh, if you feel this is not comfortable, I can understand that. Um, you know, I feel strongly about this medical benefit, as strong as I do about, you know, these other medical benefits. And um, I'm not going to force you, but I'm also not going to ignore the issue just because you think it's ridiculous. It's, you know, if you tell me, I think your blood pressure medicines are ridiculous. I'm not going to stop talking about your hypertension because my job is to advocate for your health. And, and here is the evidence-based, you know, interventions that we have, but also here's what's not evidence-based. You know, we don't know a lot of things we do don't have evidence. And I'll be as honest about that, you know, giving antibiotics for bronchitis, you know, right. I don't have any evidence that that it helps, um, you know? Um, and so, we do it, but we, we really don't, you know, mammograms in your forties, we don't have compelling evidence. And so we, we do it, but I will be the first to tell you, we don't have strong evidence that this is going to improve your life. Right, I think the key um, points to take from here is that you're communicating that you care about the patient, that you want evidence-based information, but you respect them, even if they don't agree with you. Right, right. And I do try to say, and I always say, I wouldn't want to lose you, you know? And I have lost a lot of patients during the COVID pandemic a lot, you know, as a primary care doctor with patients with multiple medical illnesses, a lot of my patients died and it was a horrible grieving situation. And most patients do know people who died and maybe COVID's a little less virulent right now, but people are still dying every day. And so, you know, I will still, I, I will not leave it because you are my patient and, and I can't take something off the table that I think we could really, could, might save your life. It might not, that is true. It might not. I, I don't have a crystal ball. And if I did, life would be much simpler. And I could say, you need it and you don't, but I don't have that. So the best I can do is offer you and advocate, you know, strongly for this because I, I can only give you what I think is, is, is the right thing. And then, and then I leave the choice to you, but I'll be your advocate no matter what. And like, if you decide not to do it, you know, I'm not going to fire you from my practice. I'll respect it. I will come back to this next year. Like I'm not going to throw it out the window because I still think it's important, but I'll understand that. And usually we, we kind of like, it becomes a little bit humorous, you know, okay, here we go. We're back to the flu right. shot. You know, um, I had patients slinked under their chairs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, give me, give me your compelling reason. Give me your best. I'll give you right. my best. And, and, um, and I think it's also, if you've established a relationship in other areas, patients will, you know, understand that and disagree. And, and, um, and then, it's the same thing for when you mess up in some other area. If you've established a respectful relation that you care about the patient and you've made a mistake, we, we do it, it's gonna happen. You know, patients will understand that. And if um, most of them, right? Some will go yelling and screaming no matter what you do or don't do, but that's really a minority. Uh, to be honest, I would find, see most patients are incredibly grateful 
respectful, appreciative um, understanding of your limitations. They understand how we can disagree over things. I mean, mostly patients, it's the same thing when you hear patients, oh, they hate all doctors except my doctor, right? Mm -hmm. I think that when it comes to the one-on-one, -on -one, patients respect their doctors and doctors love their patients. I mean, it really, you know, mostly there's a few outliers that, you know, but mostly, you know, it's a really positive thing, um, I, I find, you know, I mostly love seeing my patients and most of my patients seem happy to be there and, and willing to, to do the work to, and, and appreciative of what we do and understanding of the limitations. Um, uh, you know, we, we got back in person after COVID, it was really a relief, you know, to see those patients, to hug them, to get back in touch. We missed each other. Right. Now, the, the human relationship, you know, as reviewers of your books have said, is at the core the core of the doctor-patient relationship, right? Or the clinician-patient relationship, because we're being more inclusive here, right? Yeah, and, 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 and I always say that the, the, the doctor-patient conversation or the nurse-patient conversation is our single most powerful diagnostic tool. And I stand right. by that compared to any, I mean, think of all of our diagnostic tools and I'm not a lot of, I love MRIs and echoes and PET scans, they're great, but each of them does one thing one way. Pretty good, but just one thing. You only can do one thing with, you know, with a CAT scan or that's to do a scan. But the conversation between, um, you know, a patient and their clinician, their caregiver is an incredibly sophisticated tool. We can make so many diagnoses. We can do treatments. We can explore issues. We can establish trust. We can make life-changing decisions just in the talking. And, I, and when I, I was giving grand rounds yesterday at Vanderbilt, talking to, to um, medical students, house staff and faculty, you know, when we have, when the power goes out or Epic goes down, right? We can practice medicine. It's hard, it's harder, it's frustrating, but you can do it, right? But think about when you have a comatose patient and you can't right. talk to them. You can have all the greatest tools in the world. It's like practicing medicine with two hands tied behind your back. You, it's so hard to take care of a patient when you can't communicate. Right. And that's the difference. Our medical tools are great, but our conversation tool is essential. There is, we can do almost nothing without it. And we can do so many things with it in concert with our other tools, which I love. But if I had to pick one tool, if you have to stand on one leg only, I'd rather have my, you know, conversation um, and intact than my other tools intact. Right. Did you find that when your EMR goes down, you breathe in a way a sigh of relief because you can actually face the patient? I mean, you know, you have to pay later to do all those notes. <laughs> it's really, it's kind of a relief, you know? Yes. It's, yeah, COVID, suddenly in COVID, we got kind of like a free pass to like skip all the, the garbage we normally do. Amazing. And there's something sort of, you could just yeah. do the medicine. And there was something really liberating about that, which sort of shows you, you know, the situation we're in now. Right. Well, you and I are not going to fix that. People right. listening to this are probably not going to fix that, though maybe somebody out there listening with. Yeah. <laughs> but in the meantime, I think you've given us so much important information. And I really recommend everybody read your books. Um, they're phenomenal. And it's really been helpful for me as a physician and as a patient to read your books. So I want to thank you so, so much for doing this with me. Yeah, I'd love to give us a little plug for our literary magazine. This is the Bellevue Literary Review. Oh, yes. We publish fiction, poetry, nonfiction about health, illness, and healing. And it's a beautiful book with a nice new book smell, but we also have Ooh. digital versions and we encourage anyone is, can submit their, their writings and anyone can read it. So please check us out, the Bellevue Literary Review. Right. And it's not just for, for healthcare people, right. it's for anyone. Because we're all affected by health. Right, right. Oh, that is amazing. I have to thank you so much. This has been an amazing opportunity for me and for my listeners. I thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. You too. Thanks for listening to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast. If you've enjoyed this, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share this with your friends. For more information, check out our Instagram at joma underscore org. Check out our website, www.joma.org, that's J-O-W-M-A dot org, or email us at health at joma.org.